This is Heart Rhythm TV. I'm Roderick Tung. When I was on my pediatrics rotation, they always told me that pediatric patients are not just small adults. And I think there's plenty of evidence of that in this featured article of the month with the 2021 PACES expert consensus statement on indications for SEED in children and pediatric patients. And with me, I have Mali Shaw from CHOP, University of Pennsylvania. Welcome, Mali. Thank you, Rod. And we have Michael Silka from LA Children's USC. Welcome, Michael. Thank you. Congratulations. It's really a lot of work to put a, get together a consensus statement. And the two of you have co-authored a beauty, and that's why we're featuring it. We really want to dive in for our viewers to talk about some of these very specific guidelines that you've adapted and want to communicate to the audience about seed in, in children. So there's so much to take to take there. There is a beautiful top 10 take home messages. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about Michael, the history of guidelines in pediatrics and seed. Okay, well, the initial guidelines for cardiac implantable devices was published in, in 1984 uh, by a group of seven people, I believe. And uh, Dr. Paul Gillette was the sole pediatric representative. Um, this guideline in 1984 solely addressed the use of pacemakers. Um, and what I think is most notable about that is uh, the initial guideline proposals by Dr. Gillette, really based on what we would consider very limited data, has really stood up the test of time. The, I mean, the critical issues we deal with, with pacemakers in children largely relate to congenital complete heart block when we need pacemakers, how long to wait after surgery for implantation of a pacemaker, and then a few other assorted topics. But the recommendations Dr. Gillette made in 1984 really have stood up the test of time and are largely unchanged in the most current document. Now, the one thing that's beautiful about this document is it's so honest. It's so evidence-based. And it being evidence-based, it acknowledges when there's a lack of evidence. Mali, can you talk a little bit about the evidence of, with defibrillators and the recommendation? Yes. Uh, first of all, uh, Rod, I want to thank Heart Rhythm TV for featuring us, and thank you for hosting this show. Uh, great to be here. Um, one of the areas, uh, as you mentioned, uh, are defibrillators, and there is really very little evidence, especially for primary prevention ICDs in children across disease spectrums. Uh, a couple of examples that come to mind are patients with non-ischemic dilated cardiomyopathy, where for decades we've been using the adult gold standard of implanting ICDs in patients with LV ejection fraction equal to or less than 35%. Now it turns out in children, the incidence of sudden cardiac death with non-ischemic dilate, dilated cardiomyopathy is quite low. And therefore, it really brings into the question whether primary prevention ICDs with all their risks and uh, implant complications really afford any benefit to overall patient survival. And another example is um, the field of cardiac channelopathies. First of all, the, the prevalence of diseases is very low. So it's really quite difficult to get a handle on who will benefit from a primary prevention ICD. And uh, we want to emphasize the role of other therapies such as pharmacologic treatment and the role of cardiac uh, sympathetic denervation as alternatives to ICD implantation. And Michael, you had alluded to some of the, I guess, newer recommendations or thoughts on AV block. Can you comment about some of the features about congenital AV block as well as waiting in the post-surgical setting? Yes. Uh, so we've gone back and forth about how long a patient should wait after surgery to be paced. I've been on the guideline committees for now over 20 years, and it, who you have in the room largely you get a lot of diversity of opinion, I would say, how long to wait after surgery. Um, when there are thoracic surgeons in the room and the issue is heart block after an AV valve or mitral valve replacement, they generally want to wait 48 hours and then proceed with pacemaker implant. Um, maybe it's a different substrate we deal with, but we have fairly good doc evidence that in with patients that have post-surgical heart, heart block, about 30% will recover in the first three days. And 
another 30% will recover by one week postoperative. So largely our position has been to wait about a week after surgery. Some people would argue to wait nine to 10 days. Um, there is a small incremental increase, but that has to be offset by the weight of having the patient stay in the ICU. So the, we generally, can, I think, still center around a seven day duration postoperatively before pacemaker implant. The, the one exception in our new guidelines is there are certain surgeries uh, which by the nature of the anatomic resections, um, there is a very high likelihood of permanent damage to the cardiac conduction system. And this is a somewhat controversial recommendation, but, but we think that there are times when there is a very, very low probability of the conduction system recovering. And in such cases, um, we think it's at least a 2B recommendation. That is, it's kind of an individual case decision that earlier pacemaker implantation is probably a valid approach in such patients. I love that. And obviously in, in the adult world, there's definitely cases that we know that sometimes all of a sudden, all of that AV conduction resumes by day five or six. It's always a battle with length of stay and those other issues, but clearly a seed implant in a pediatric patient has much greater implications than a 70 or 80 year old that's status post aortic valve mitral and cabbage. Um, so Molly, in, in terms of one thing that I loved was also the idea that really emphasizes the, the clinical uh, decision-making. And the first one for the take-home message is just sinus bradycardia. There is no threshold, a numerical number, and it really emphasizes symptom rhythm correlation. Can you just speak to that a little bit as well? Sure. Um, so we decided not to assign a threshold heart rate for implantation of a pacemaker for sinus bradycardia for multiple reasons. Some of our patients are infants, and without a clear clinical correlation, subjecting an infant to lifelong device therapy um, is probably not in the best interest of the patient. And, and two, sometimes sinus bradycardia or transient sinus node dysfunction can recover. So without having absolute clinical correlation, um, we didn't feel that a heart rate criteria alone was sufficient to implant a pacemaker. And, and really, I mean, the, the, the focus of these guidelines is taking into consideration pacing a child at a very young age and maintaining these devices and device changes throughout a lifespan. So we really want to be sure that a patient needs a device and then implant it. Fantastic. Michael, any thoughts on how to deal with the lower income population with seeds? And, and that pediatric population that's always been challenging? Yeah, it's, it, it, well, it remains a challenge. That's the first thing I can say. Um, living on the border with Mexico, uh, first of all, you know, people should be aware that there are very stripped down, simplified pacemakers that are developed by the major pacemaker companies for use in other countries that are sold for a fraction of the cost of the devices in the United States. It's always tricky when they come into clinic because you have to have special software to interrogate the devices. Um, I think one thing Molly alluded to also is that there is consideration of the use, reuse of pacing devices. Uh, um, again, that's not something we do in the United States, at least on a routine basis, but I think in third world countries, there are certain realities that we, we have to deal with. And uh, that certainly there may be some benefit to that. Um, I think we have to be cautious um, about mostly about patients, I think, who have postoperative heart block because we, you know, natural history studies have shown patients who have postoperative heart block have a fairly high mortality rate if they are not paced. So uh, I think that is the one patient population where cardiac devices are concerned, where we can't cut too many corners. Thank you for that. You know, in going through these top 10 messages, which you've really beautifully distilled, and I hope all of the readership takes a look at that. One of them that was really striking to me, uh, being a sudden death prevention person, was that you write that in over 50% of cases of cardiac arrest, 
it's an unidentified cause, can, that should really be a call to arms. Can you comment on that, Mali and, and, and Michael? Sure, I'll, I'll, I'll go first. Um, so that, that's true. In over 50% of uh, cases, there is no cause because uh, many times the disease is uh, progressive, right? So when you first see a child, you may not see the phenotype manifest, and it's only over decades with the phenotype manifest. So th this is not an uncommon theme. That doesn't mean that the disease is not identifiable. It just means that we don't have a phenotype at a young age. And, and that therefore, these patients need to be carefully followed to, to, to see where they, they actually end up. Yes, well, you know, it, it is surprising how the reported incidence of unexplained sudden death is as high a percentage as, as, it, as has been reported. There were several recent publications in the last year, one from New Zealand and the other from Canada that um, kind of almost had identical numbers in, in young patients uh, who were resuscitated from sudden cardiac arrest trying to determine the cause of their event. Um, some of the cases may have been myocarditis, but I don't think that explains the large majority. And, and these are patients that had comprehensive um, cardiovascular and genetic workup in an attempt to determine the cause. Um, I'm sure the waters were muddied by VUSs coming up in some of these patients. But again, um, I think the important point is that a significant percentage of young patients who have a sudden cardiac arrest it's an unexplained event and likely will remain, remain so. Um, the question becomes, do they all need defibrillators? And at least in, in, in my and our experience, um, when you don't know the cause, but you've had a resuscitated uh, cardiac arrest due to a shockable rhythm, the patient will end up with a defibrillator because there's no other clear treatment alternative. And I think that for the adults that are watching, they probably want you to comment on where are we with sub QICD? Where are we with leadless technologies? Where are we with conduction system pacing? And obviously it is in its infancy, pun intended, uh, even adults, but obviously probably more so in pediatrics. Molly, could you just chat a little bit about that? Yes, uh, Rod. So these are definitely emerging technologies for us in pediatrics. Um, just for the audience to know that there is uh, PACES, which is the Pediatric and Congenital Electrophysiology Society Registry for leadless pacing, as well as for conduction system pacing. Um, the numbers are, are small right now because we're still trying to figure out uh, which uh, which patient is an ideal candidate for implantation. For leadless pacing, a concern remains um, about the extractability, right? Because if you implant a leadless pacemaker in a 12 or a 13 year old, uh, you're looking at extract extraction strategies over the next several decades. Uh, subcutaneous ICDs uh, are more, more uh, prevalent now. Um, and, and again, the, the size of the device sometimes precludes implantation and conduction system pacing, especially for certain diseases like uh, congenitally corrected transposition of the great arteries seems to be an ideal strategy for physiologic pacing. Well, Molly and Michael, I really want to thank you for your generosity with your time to join us on Heart Rhythm TV, your time in preparing this expert consensus. This is not a PACES document. This is an HRS, ACC, AHA, AEPC collaboration, and it's endorsed by Latin America, India, as well as APHRS. So this is really the document to read. Congratulations on this beautiful, masterful piece of work. It's been a great resource for me in preparing for this as well. And congratulations. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Rod. Thank you.